Now we're going to learn why it is that the narrator in this story tells us that Jesse Bantley is a fanatic, as he'd said. As time passed and Jesse grew to know people better, he began to think of himself as an extraordinary man, one set apart from his fellows. He wanted terribly to make his life a thing of great importance. And also we learn when he was studying to be a minister, he'd studied and thought of God in the Bible with his whole mind and heart, which could be a good thing, but in his case it's become excessive because he now thinks that he's, he's, he's special, he's set apart from everyone else. And it, he, it said that he looked about at his fellow men and saw how like clods, like just clumps of dirt they lived. And it seemed to him he could not bear to become also such a clod. So he's got quite an ego. He feels better than all of the people around him. His wife, remember, died in childbirth. And uh, when she's pregnant, he, he, he desperately wants a son. And here's the description of why. Jesse's mind went back to the men of Old Testament days, Abraham, Moses, who also had owned lands and herds of animals. He remembered how God had come down out of the skies and talked to these men, and he wanted God to notice and to talk to him also. A kind of feverish, boyish eagerness to in some way achieve in his own life the flavor of significance that had hung over these men took possession of him. Being a prayerful man, he spoke of the matter aloud to God, and the sound of his own words strengthened and fed his eagerness. I am a new kind of man come into possession of these fields, he declared. Look upon me, O God. Now, in this story, obviously, uh, uh, piety, religiosity could be a good thing, but in this case, he's 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 gone into impiety. It's become uh, unreligious to start to believe that you could be that you're a Moses, that you're that you're an Abraham, that you're 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 one of the Old Testament patriarchs, and God is going to come down and talk to you and give you things just because you are. Uh, is 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 the height of ignorance uh, of egotism and and also um, uh, look he just calls upon God look upon me oh God like he's not supposed to be ordering God around if he were truly religious there would be a bit of humility in him which there does not seem to be so the reason he wants his daughter, his wife to give birth to his son is so that he can have a so he can be a father of sons like the Old Testament patriarchs who shall be rulers. He so desperately wants, wants a son. I'm going to actually keep scrolling past that one. His wife eventually gives birth to a daughter, but this is him telling God he wants a son. So he jumps to his feet and he runs through the night. And as he ran, he called to God. His voice carried far over the low hills. Jehovah of hosts, he cried, send to me this night out of the womb of Catherine a son. Let thy grace alight upon me. Send me a son to be called David, who shall help me to pluck at last all of these lands out of the hands of the Philistines and turn them to thy service and to the building of thy kingdom on earth. So many problems here. Uh, one, he's talking about that of the womb of Catherine, a son. Catherine is his wife. Uh, you don't generally talk about your wife as a womb who will give you a son if, if you love her and think of her as a person. Uh, two, uh, he's calling, um, he's demanding that God give him something that he wants. Uh, three, he wants a David to inherit, uh, the king of kings, right, uh, before, you know, and David is, is one of the most powerful rulers in the, in the, in biblical stories, and also he's referring to all of the other people that live around him as Philistines, who are the folks that God keeps telling everyone need to be wiped off the face of the earth, so, so many problems here. I mean, he's, this is not religiosity. This is fanaticism of a, a profoundly egotistical and in, inhumane uh, uh, brand. Now, the story ends, that part of the story ends there. But in fact, it picks up with David Hardy. There is a David that gets 
born, which is what Jesse had wanted. But David Hardy of Winesburg, Ohio, was the grandson of Jesse Bentley, the owner of Bentley Farms. Notice how we're almost beginning again. We've ended the story of Jesse with him calling for a son, and we're beginning a new story about David of Winesburg, Ohio, the grandson of Jesse Bentley, who is, as if we didn't know this already, the owner of Bentley Farms, the owner and overlord. When David was 12 years old, he went to the old Bentley place to live. His mother, Louise Bentley, the girl who came into the world on that night when Jesse ran through the fields crying to God that he be given a son, had grown to womanhood on the farm and had married young John Hardy of Winesburg, who became a banker. Louise and her husband did not live happily together, and everyone agreed that she was to blame. She was a small woman with sharp gray eyes and black hair. From childhood, she had been inclined to fits of temper, and when not angry, she was often morose and silent. In Winesburg, it was said that she drank. So you get a sense of Winesburg, very gossipy, all these folks standing around. I think she drinks. Yeah, she definitely drinks. Oh, it's all her fault. But we've also learned something about her father. Her father so desperately wanted a boy, and when his wife gives birth to a girl, and of course his wife dies in the process. Uh, he, he seems not very focused on his wife or her death, but he is focused on the fact that he didn't get the son he wanted. He got a daughter, which is not what he wanted. And so she lives her whole life on the farm as an extreme disappointment to her father who wanted a son to carry on uh, his his uh, his overlordship, it, so he could be a father of sons and a special person to God. On the other hand, Louise does get married, his daughter, and she gives birth. And interesting that she names the child she has David. She gives her father the David that he wants, and and he takes him. Uh, when David was twelve, he leaves his mother and he goes to live with his grandfather. We're going to go on and learn a little bit about, about Louise. Louise could not be made happy. She flew into half-insane fits of temper, during which she was sometimes silent, sometimes noisy and quarrelsome. She swore and cried out in her anger. She got a knife from the kitchen and threatened her husband's life. Once, she deliberately set fire to the house, and often she hid herself away for days in her own room. So we can see that she's lived a, a very unhappy life. Oh gosh, I don't know what this is doing now. A very unhappy life, got it back. Uh, and a knife from the kitchen and threatened her husband's life. She's actually not very different from Jesse's brothers who were also uh, apparently kind of dangerous, but also deliberately setting fire to the house and hiding away for days in her room. She's obviously depressed, anger management, anxiety. I mean, this woman has all kinds of problems. Um, she's clearly had a miserable childhood and now she is, she's not happy and she's never going to be happy. David, grow, the baby, growing up in this house, uh, obviously does not have a good childhood either. So young David Hardy grew up in the house with this woman and as can well be imagined, there was not much joy in his childhood. He was too young then to have opinions on his own about people but at times it was difficult for him not to have very definite opinions about the woman who was his mother. David was always a quiet, orderly boy and for a long time was thought by the people of Winesburg to be something of a dullard. So he's so quiet that they think he's not very bright, which is actually funny because in the story, the, the thinker about Seth Richmond, he's very quiet and people assume he's brilliant even though he's actually not very brilliant just because he's quiet. So, so part of these stories is just about how people perceive other people. This one's angry, she obviously drinks, when actually she's just had a miserable childhood and has anger uh, problems for the rest of her life as a result. This one's quiet, he must be not very bright. This one's quiet, he must be very bright. It's about how people grab onto ideas and just throw them around and misuse them. So I suppose that's how the truths that were originally beautiful become false. So, so David grows up in this house. Uh, he's, his mother's very unhappy and it makes him, him unhappy. Uh, this will make it no surprise that, uh, that he eventually goes to live with his grandfather. There also, there's this little moment here in his life 
where he runs away from the home and he's gone and his his mother absolutely panics uh, which is unusual um, and when he comes home there's a description of what happens when he comes home there were no lights in the house but his mother appeared and clutched him eagerly in her arms David thought she had suddenly become another woman he could not believe that so delightful a thing had happened with her own hands Louise Hardy bathed his tired young body and cooked him food she would not let him go to bed but when he had put on his nightgown blew out the lights and sat down in a chair to hold him in her arms for an hour the woman sat in the darkness and held her boy and all the time she kept talking in a low voice David could not understand what had so changed her and this is very sad this woman is so unhappy she she's she makes everyone's life miserable and tries to burn down the house her son grows up not really liking her and she's not paying much attention to him and when she does he's cruel in this one moment he runs away from home and for an hour she's nice to him and he is beside himself with joy he is so happy to have her attention her kind attention and and that's sad that's really sad that that he's lived that way he thought that he would have been willing to go through the frightful experience of of having run away from home and been lost a thousand times to be sure of finding at the end of the long black road a thing so lovely as his mother had suddenly become so it's just the sadness of his life experience that that this horrible experience is just made all worth it because his mother spends one hour paying positive attention to him shows you what an unhappy life he's had but at 12 years old he goes to live at the Bentley farm with Jesse old Jesse came into town and fairly demanded that he be given charge of the boy remember from his perspective this is his David that's going to be his son it's his grandson but this is the child he's always wanted instead of Louise he never wanted a girl the old man was excited and determined on having his way I believe it he's he's an overlord and notice Louise's response you can see that she's still uh, thinking about how she was raised and how miserable her childhood was the house uh, where she the Jesse Bentley's house is an atmosphere not corrupted by my presence she says sharply harshly her shoulders shook and she seemed about to fly into a fit of temper that house is a place for a man child although it was never a place for me you never wanted me there and of course the air of your house did me no good it was like poison in my blood but it will be different with him so we learn that Louise no matter her age is still living constantly thinking about how much her father did not want her he wanted a boy and so she's convinced that it's right to send David to Jesse's house because it is a place for a man child a boy will be okay there um, she was poisoned by the environment she says but a boy will flourish and indeed when David gets to the house we learn everyone in the old house became happy after the boy went there the hard insistent thing in Jesse Bentley that had kept the people in the house silent and timid that had never been dispelled by the presence of the girl Louise was apparently swept away by the coming of the boy it was as though God had relented and sent a son to the man so from Jesse's perspective God finally gave him what he he told him he wants a boy but also because Jesse's happy the overlord is happy um, everyone in the house uh, starts to feel a little happier also um, when Louise was there as a girl it didn't make anyone happy because Jesse was miserable but with David there at the age of 12 uh, Jesse's happy so everyone else becomes happy and it talks here about the the disappointment that had come on to Jesse when a, a daughter was born from his perspective God has turned on him uh, but he did still believe that God might at any moment make himself manifest out of the clouds the winds of the clouds but he no longer demanded such recognition instead he prayed for it so I suppose he has been somewhat humbled instead of demanding things of God he's he's praying for recognition from God and by the bringing of David his grandson he he feels that he's gotten that this passage here talks about materialism the materialistic age and how Jesse is uh, a sort of 
a vanguard for that. He's bringing that in. Jesse is a person who who believes in God deeply, but he also believes that that owning possessions is God's way of, of, of showing favor. So the idea that he's rich uh, because God has allowed him to become rich. He's special in God's eyes, so he's also special in the marketplace. He makes a ton of money. So he there's the headlong rush of mankind towards acquiring possessions. Notice that Jesse has more than one of those grotesque truths. Um, he grabs on to the idea of becoming wealthy as a way of being special incredibly beyond need wealthy and also the idea that God will recognize him as a new Abraham or Moses and that that he can just reject his daughter and then take away from his daughter or her son to have for himself because he'd always wanted a son he's extremely egotistic he's fanaticist in everything he does he's I think a, a, a cruel man and it's difficult to feel sympathy for him I think it's easier to feel sympathy for Louise, even though, of course, she's also uh, carrying on that family tradition of misery and unhappiness. It seems like the whole family has just passed on a tradition of making one another unhappy. Uh, so the Batley family and the Hardy family are, are not happy places, uh, even though for a moment here, when David is living in the farm, things are a little bit happier. I'm going to stop here and I'll pick up again uh, with our next video chat.